The Master Keys series of mechanical keyboards from Cooler Master features genuine Cherry MX switches and the flexibility of choice. Whether you want small, medium, or large, you can pick your size and pick your color with RGB and clear white LED backlighting options. Click the sponsor link in the description for more information. Excellent! What's up guys, welcome to Paul's Hardware, and today's video where at long last I will be doing some testing, some overclocking, some benchmarks and performance on my February build. This is a mini ITX system, it's designed to be fairly small, not super compact, but relatively small. It's a mini ITX build, of course. And then it's meant to also be very powerful. So we have a 7700K, I also have a GTX 1080 in there. I also have uh, all SSDs as far as the uh, storage that's in there. And of course I have this uh, pretty fancy looking Lian Lee PCQ37 case, uh, aluminum and tempered glass. Uh, and of course I have some stuff to talk about because if you watched me actually build this thing, it was a time lapse. There was no talking at all. It was all just pictures and video. So um, uh, why don't we start with a little bit more feedback on the build itself. I wanted to give you guys a better idea of the actual size of this of this thing, which is, I don't know, it's it's between small and large for a mini ITX case, let's put it that way. This is a Fantex M2 Evolve in the back. I also set it uh, right here next to the Corsair 380T, which is also on the large size for a mini ITX system. And you can see the 380T is just a little bit taller and a little bit fatter. Um, but the Q37 here is against, like, it's not the tiniest for sure, like if you compare it to a Node 202 or something like that. But I think the trade-off is that you can fit full-size desktop parts in it. So you can fit to 240, uh, 240 rad at the top. Um, there's also a lot more space for cable management in here than you have in something like a Node 202. Um, and I'd say for a larger size build, something you want to show off, because of course as you're seeing all the reflections with the tempered glass, um, I, I, I think it works pretty good. So these are the tiny screws that hold the tempered glass side panels on and um, once those are removed, the tempered glass itself, um, well at least this front piece will kind of rest in place because it tucks under this little piece right there. But beyond that, they just kind of pull out. This is a bit of a, uh, uh, has a gray glass to it, so it is sort of slightly uh, shadowed, shadowy, whatever, tinted, I guess would be the right word for that. But then of course, once you get that off, you can see uh, right inside like that. Uh, let me get this other side off too. So this piece here is more of a challenge to sort of get on. I mean, it's not like it's completely impossible or anything. It's just a little bit more difficult. I'm sort of holding, just holding it in place right now, but it just sort of sits on the slip at the bottom and then those four screws all hold it in place. So again, it's like not the best mounting situation for tempered glass that I've ever seen, but you know, once you get it on there, it, it stays in place okay. Uh, speaking of, tempered glass on the front and the side here means, uh, combined with the fact that we have lovely uh, uh, brushed aluminum for the rest of the construction, top panel here and side panel here, means there's no real good way to like hold this system. Like if you need to pick it up or something like that, because at the base here, this, this sort of, uh, I don't know, area at the bottom goes around the entire bottom, so there's nowhere to kind of get your fingers under there. So I found myself just sort of putting my finger on, my hand on the corner, tilting the case up so I could get my hand under the bottom, and then I would be able to kind of lift it and move it however I, I needed to. Um, so that was getting things done, but um, this seems like the kind of case you're, you're not gonna be taking on the go with you, you know, like the 380T over here with its handle. You're gonna wanna get it set up, put it where you want it to be, and then probably leave it there. Now you may have noticed when I introduced all the parts for the original build video that I had a different graphics card. I had the um, ICX version of the EVGA 1080 for the Win 2. I uh, swapped that with the Founders Edition GTX 1080 because this one is, uh, the length wasn't an issue, it was going to fit lengthwise. It was actually the width, how wide the uh, PCB and part of the cooler was uh, on that EVGA card. And I don't have that here right now, but I can demonstrate at least with this Gigabyte card, um, which is that if you have extension right here, if it's a wide card that sticks out this a ways, then uh, you're probably going to run into some conflicts with this case because there's not a ton of clearance when it comes to that direction. That and you're also going to need to, uh, you, it's it's right here fitting it in that would cause the conflict. That extended PCB didn't allow me to tuck the graphics card back in here and just get it to seat properly with the motherboard. So yeah, go with the smaller graphics card I guess is the answer to that. And um, yeah, just bear in mind, no, no thick graphics cards, I guess. But the Founders Edition is actually a good choice for a system like this because it's got sort of an enclosed cooler and it's going to eject a lot of the warm air out the back of the case. 
And also it's kind of nice because you do have uh, what would be effectively your intakes down here at the bottom. Now, uh, another thing that was pointed out in that video is that I pretty much have a completely uh, negative pressure system going on right here. I put these two rear uh, 80 millimeter fans from Noctua as exhaust. These top exhaust fans from the uh, H100 IV2 are also set up as exhaust. So basically everything is pushing air out the top and out the back. What that means is uh, negative pressure, so um, we might potentially have dust issues in the future if I ran this long term, like along some of the edges here. But it does also mean that the primary intake, which is going to be down here at the bottom, is hopefully where most of the air is going to be um, coming in from. So along these grooves right here, air would go in that way and then pulled up through there by the negative pressure. I did do a bit of temperature testing with this. I didn't do, I, I wouldn't call it extensive, but um, temperatures are just fine and I think sw uh, switching these or like flipping those around could maybe uh, like equalize the pressure in here a little bit better, but then you'd be looking at no uh, filter, uh, no air filter for these back here. Whereas there is an air filter down here on the bottom, which is held on by magnets, so there you go. And uh, I would imagine for uh, maintenance on this thing, you just tip it over like I've done right now. Air would probably, or dust would probably collect down here at the bottom. You can just pop that off and clean it out. A couple final things to point out for the build. Um, one is where all the pass-throughs are here. There's a couple at the top, there's a couple on the side, there's a couple more down at the bottom, at least uh, relative to the motherboard tray. And they all have these covers on them, like this one right here with a couple Phillips head screws holding them in place. So you, I, I really tried to minimize the number of those that I actually removed. So there's the main one that I have most of the stuff coming through from the motherboard here. And then I did, uh, I removed this one up here too. These at the top, are difficult to work with, at least if you have the drive cage in. The drive cage on the opposite side basically means that the majority of actually both of these uh, panel covers is blocked, so you kind of have to feed everything right up through the corner back there. Also, while it is nice to be able to individually remove those panels, um, you know, so you can cover the ones you're not using, it would be really nice to have grommets behind them because uh, I'll be honest, when, when I'm just looking at kind of that bare pass through right there, I mean, doesn't look terrible. It's got a, it's got a bit of a plastic ring around the edge, but um, it doesn't look the greatest either. Um, and then finally, I would like to give Lian Lee some uh, some props for their panels here, the top and the and the rear panel. I'm sorry, the top panel and the opposite side panel. These are just incredibly easy to remove. It's got a little lip back there, and really you just grab it and tug, it pops off just like that. And there you can see that other dust filter on the top as well. So there's your uh, brush metal panel for the top. Putting it back in place is as easy as pushing back down on it like that. And then the opposite side panel uh, removes in exactly the same way. And that reveals the opposite side where we can see our VX500 uh, as well as our Corsair SF600 power supply. So tiny, so cute. Look how tiny it is. Uh, 600 watt power supply, but it's been doing a great job powering everything so far. Perfectly adequate for a single GPU system with a GTX 1080 like this one right here. And uh, look, it's even got a zero fan mode. I like that. Cabling is also all black, which uh, looks pretty nice too, and although this isn't my best kale management work, everything is tidy enough and there's still plenty of room uh, allowed there for airflow. Beyond that, pretty much everything else is installed over here on the front, and uh, I would like to point out that I did add the USB uh, cable for the Corsair H100 IV2 that's going up there and then around the back and then plugging in via the USB 2 port. There is a USB single USB 2 header on here, so that worked out for that. Uh, and everything else is connected. So the only other things that I had to add that weren't in the uh, list of products that I initially listed off was uh, a couple fan splitters. So um, since this board really only has a couple uh, uh, four pin fan headers, I did use fan splitters so I could connect. Uh, well, the, the, the uh, Corsair had one kind of built in, then I used a fan splitter so I could connect uh, both of these 80 millimeter, uh, 80 millimeter uh, Noctua fans to the same header on the board. Now let's move into some actual testing and what I did was I overclocked the snot out of the CPU and the GPU and then I ran benchmark tests. So um, that's pretty straightforward. I don't say overclock the snot out of because this is the 7700K I've used in several other builds already. And it is a decent overclocker, but it uh, can't really get too much past about 4.9 gigahertz with reasonable voltage. Uh, so that's what I ran it at. I actually started off 
being a little bit more conservative, I had it at 4.8 gigahertz, uh, and I did about a 30 minute burn-in test. Uh, and when I did that with Ida64, it was hitting about 80 to 85C max on the CPU, uh, mid to six, mid 60s to maybe low 70s average um, under load with that synthetic burn-in test. So that's like a worst case scenario for the CPU. I figured I probably had a little bit more thermal headroom after that, and since the CPU I knew already could hit 4.9 gigahertz, I thought why not try to just bump up the voltage a little bit because those initial tests at 4.8 didn't add any uh, voltage and I was running uh, the fans, at least uh, with the Cooler Master software, the Link software that you can, you can use to control the H100 IV2 in silent mode. When I jumped up to 4.9, since I had to add some voltage, I also changed the uh, profile from silent to standard mode on the H100 IV2, which does add a little bit of noise, but also improves the cooling performance. Uh, added voltage in the form of plus 95 millivolts, at least according to the ASRock UEFI, uh, using a voltage offset mode. Uh, that led to 90 degrees Celsius max temperatures on the CPU using Ida64 synthetic benchmark tests, and that was after about 20 to 25 minutes under load. Of course, I could have let it run longer to reach full-on thermal saturation point with the uh, liquid CPU cooler, but I thought that was enough to give me a ballpark, and it's probably not going to get too much worse than that. Mid-70s to low-80s average uh, was what I saw. It was only spiking up to about 90C, though. Um, when it was actually looking at the running temperatures with the test on, it was in the mid-70s to low-80s on average range. So. That's adequate. It's obviously not the best of what you would expect when you're using a uh, closed loop cooler like this one with a larger 240 millimeter radiator, but definitely within range of what I wanted. And given that we're in a smaller form factor system with not quite as much airflow, uh, I found it to be, again, perfectly adequate. After that, I overclocked the GPU, ended up adding plus 240 megahertz GPU clock and plus 125 megahertz memory clock, maxed out the power target, uh, and I had the fan profile at standard. I did not add fan speed and that led to about 60% max fan speed while under load. With my overclock, uh, the GPU base clock was 1847, boost clock was 1974. It was peaking at 2113, which is pretty impressive, but after the temperatures creep up, it's uh, averaged out to about 2025 under load, and that's after thermal saturation point is reached, and the max temperature was 85 degrees Celsius. Again, a little bit warmer than what I would, what I would hope for for a 1080 overall, but we are using the Founders Edition card, which does has, have the benefit of ejecting more of the hot air out of the case, and uh, 85C with an overclock card is not terrible, and it was not uh, throttling at all, at least once it settled down to about that 2025 point. So, all that said, uh, it's, it's performing pretty well so far, and I, I'm happy to say that the overclocks I've achieved on the CPU and the GPU aren't really that much less or even significantly less at all than what I was achieving on an open test bed or in a full size case. So that's pretty cool. Next up there's some noise testing because we obviously want to hear what this sounds like. So let's start with idle. So idle is obviously pretty quiet. Let's move over to the CPU test. So this is with the Corsair H100 IV2 doing everything it can to keep the CPU temperatures down while running the Ida64 stress test. Let's listen to that. And then we have a gaming audio test. This is using Unigen Heaven to put a heavy load on the GPU, not quite so much on the GPU, and this is of course with the GPU overclocked as mentioned.
So the gaming performance is quite solid. That is what we would expect with the GTX 1080 paired with a 7700K, especially when overclocked. Uh, I wanted to show a little bit of the SSD performance since I do have the P600 NVMe SSD in here from Intel. It's gonna be faster than a standard SATA SSD, but it's difficult without setting up a more strict side-by-side -side benchmark performance comparison to give you guys a real idea. It definitely seems a little bit peppier than a standard SATA SSD does, but since SSDs are already pretty fast as it is when it just comes to responsiveness, I thought I'd do a quick boot test since it does seem to boot pretty fast. So I've shut down. This is using Windows 10 Hibernate and uh, I just hit power and maybe there's a, maybe I'm timing this or maybe you guys are timing this. I don't, I don't, maybe you're just watching the video, but hopefully uh, the boot process will happen. It's done. That, that's pretty fast boot. I gotta, I gotta admit, that's probably one of the fastest booting systems. And I don't think I've even set up fast boot in the UEFI uh, settings, so I could even do that. But, so let's move on to some final thoughts. Obviously, being a mini ITX build, this is on the smaller side, but it's not as small as you can go. There are some very small footprint systems that you could set up that would be significantly tinier than this. However, it's still fairly diminutive, and it still stays within a pretty small footprint. So if you needed to move it around, or if you needed to take it on the go with you, uh, it's not terribly difficult to transport, and it's definitely a lot more lightweight than, say, a full-size system with a bunch of hard drives in there. I like the diversity and flexibility of this system, uh, not just for gaming with the 7700K overclocked and the 1080, but also the fact you got 32 gigs of RAM and an all SSD storage array uh, means that you could easily use this for video editing or that sort of thing as well. Um, I like the finished product just as far as the look goes. It's pretty nice looking with the tempered glass and the brushed aluminum. Uh, and I thought everything actually worked pretty well as far as the color scheme goes, mainly black and silver with a little bit of accents. Uh, the GTX logo, of course, is always gonna stand out on the side there in green, but we did have just some very light uh, white LED accents on the Corsair products, the Dominator Platinums and H100 IV2, which I thought looked nice without being all gaudy and out there like, you know, RGB LED systems like I've got behind me over there. Uh, also wanted to point out the motherboard here from ASRock, doing a fine job. Uh, ASRock motherboards, you know, sometimes they get a bad rap, but this one, like, look, it's got dual Intel NICs, it's got Intel Wi-Fi, it's got a crap ton of USB 3.0 on the back. Uh, it's got a PS2 port, which, I don't know, I just wanted to point that out. But even when it comes to overclocking, uh, I was able to pretty much achieve the same level of performance and overclocking to 4.9 gigahertz with this CPU that I was able to with my Maximus 9 Hero full-size board back there behind me. So that's pretty cool too. So all in all, I think this is a great build for anyone who's looking for a high-end mini ITX gaming system with advanced capabilities for other things as well, especially if you're gaming at about 1440, maybe if you're considering ultra-wide like 3440 by, 30, by 1440, you could even push it up to 4K depending on the games that you're playing and the system settings that you're using. Or, I mean, if you really wanted to juice the system a little bit more, just swap that 1080 out for a 1080 Ti. That's all for this video though, guys. I hope you've enjoyed it. This has been my February build of the month, although it is already mid to late March. Don't worry, my March build is coming also very soon. That's gonna be a Ryzen system. I finally have all the parts for that, so I'm gonna be assembling that. Uh, hit the thumbs up button and let me know if you enjoyed this video and also links to all the part pro parts that I used is down in the description below. Thanks again for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.